Oh, 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 Nice to see you, to see you, nice. Nice to see you, to see you, nice. Today, me. Me, they do. Day, 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 morning, morning. Right, okay, people who are my regular, who are our regulars, the, the other 20-odd of you who don't take place in my lunacy, which is on a Tuesday evening with my uh, outside bits of Barry oddments from elsewhere. Um... There's usually 10 of you in there. So this is the lecture that we do on a Tuesday that the rest of you will be viewing uh, on Thursday. Um, and um, obviously, uh, Jessica's not taking part in this one tonight because I, I told her to have two weeks off because of her hard work. Mm. Um, anyway, we, we what I wanted to do tonight is, is take this silly thing off my head. Uh, sure. I wanted to start off with some articles of the week. We are doing the Vassa and... Sitting Bull's hair identified by a lock of his hair. Uh, hair? Hair? Get it? Oh, forget it. Uh, no, I'll leave it. A lock of Sitting Bull's hair that had lain in the museum for more than a century has been used to confirm that a 73-year-old man from South Dakota is Lakota... La um, South... Uh, Sue. Oh. oh, look, I'm getting muddled. Sue, look Chief. Sue, yeah. chick, not Sao Sue. Lakota Sue, Sue. yeah. Shut up! <laughs> it is the first time, I tell you this, has got to the end of the year now, I've had enough. It is the first <laughs> time that scientists have extracted DNA from a long dead person to confirm a living relative and opens the possibility of finding other descendants of historical figures. There is a lock of Napoleon's hair out somewhere. Maybe I'm actually descendant from him. That'd be great, wouldn't it? No. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there, there, there it is. There, there's his hair, lock of his hair. Anyway, very nice. Uh, oh, shut up! <laughs> right, uh, here we go. Remains of Anglo-Saxon church found by HS2 HS2 team. I tell you what, they didn't get this right, Anglo-Saxon, did they? They, they put the church in the way. Archaeologists working on hey, hey, I thought they stopped it. Archaeologists working on HS2 have found the remains of an Anglo-Saxon church in Buckinghamshire. The, the fight was made at St. Mary's Church in Stoke Mandeville. The thing is, they're always called St. Mary's Church, haven't they? I wish they'd be yeah. different ones. The team found flint walls underneath the remains of the Norman Church. Oh, my God. Jessica's, Jessica's joining us. I think she's got bored of her two weeks off. <laughs> um, this is going to look a bit silly, isn't it? Right, anyway, underneath <laughs> the remains of the Norman Church, which date back to 1080 on the 14th of August at 12.15. <laughs> uh, this is a fantastic discovery, the most important Anglo-Saxon discovery ever made. Oh, I wish I'd stop saying that. Every single week. The work at Old St. Mary's, what? Old St. Mary's is a new one? Fair enough. Is a unique archaeological opportunity to excavate a medieval parish church with over 900 years of meaning to the local community. Oh, I, oh and they found 3,000 bodies exhumed in the church graveyard. Wow, sir. So there you go, 3,000. Why don't they leave the poor buggers behind? Yeah. Anyway, just turn back over them. They don't mind. Right, okay. I'm just saying, but oh, guess who else has joined us? I tell you what, right? Ooh. Why don't why do we just start, right? At 7.55. <laughs> so we have all these numpties, right? Joining us late. Ooh. Anyway, nice for you to join us, Claire. It's been 12 years. Millipede fossil. Look, oh, look, look. I'm supposed to be doing this lecture, not Jess. <laughs> Milk fueled the Great Bronze Age migration. At the dawn of the Bronze Age, a warlike people from the steppe of Russia began to sweep west across Europe and as far east as Mongolia. Hang on. If they're sweeping into Europe, I'll, oh, forget it. Right. Um, these people were known as the Yam, the Yam Naya, the Yam Naya nomad. Um, as they began to conquer new lands 5,001 years ago, they introduced novel technologies, including wheeled wagons. They may also have carried with them the Indo European family of languages. We've already mentioned that. Yeah. And interestingly, the Indo European language, English, is similar 
to Hindustani. Wow. And if you and the one one wonderful thing is, if anyone's ever learned tried to learn Spanish, which I do, it's word for word translation in Spanish. Rather than if you look at something like Welsh, it's totally impossible to work out. But anyway, um, you know, I have conversations with people in Welsh. Uh, it's so interesting that I, I come up with loads of stuff and they they, they nod their head and agree. It's great. For decades, archaeologists have debated exactly how they achieved their extraordinary mobility. What they're saying, they, they've uh, analysed 56 skeletons. Why do they always examine 56 skeletons? Why don't they always have what, round her up to 100 or something? A study has now shown that they began to drink milk. So they, 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 um, they, they, they've got lactose tolerance the, rather than intolerance building for us to be able to um, drink milk today. There you go. So here we go. What they're finding is the protein trapped in dental tartar. Uh, there's a joke there. Somebody come up to me and said, uh, here's a drink. And I said, Tata. Anyway, sorry. Uh, the remnants of people's meals in the plaque on their teeth is to be found in their Tata. The researchers were able to identify okay. who had milk, yogurt, or cheese, and who had not. So obviously there was littles around then, wasn't there? Um, so yeah, that's good. I like it. So we've got, uh, we've got this evidence of sort of uh, milk being consumed. Oh, God, I wish I hadn't even started with these articles. I just want to go on. Right. Um, yeah, I tell you what, the headlines in these newspapers are actually getting more bizarre. Mm -hmm. Ale be blown. <clears throat> Beer that's 9,000 years old. Evidence of what could be the world's first post-funeral pint has been discovered by archaeologists. The scientists found the residue of beer in 9,000-year-old pottery mugs buried next to bodies in southern China. Obviously, they, they didn't have time to drink it before they died. Get it? Uh, uh, oh, oh, dear. The suggests humans enjoyed a pint 2,000 years earlier than, than <laughs> thought because they had longer opening hours. Maybe that's what killed them. With the previous oldest known evidence of beer being recipes on 7,000-year-old Egyptian papyrus skulls, chemical analysis of a drinking type mug found by archaeologists in Kwai Tao. Do you know, I love these Chinese words. I can pronounce them, but nobody else can. Kwai Tao showed traces of beer fermentation which were not found in the surrounding soil, right? Um, these artifacts are probably some of the earliest known painted pottery in the world. No pottery of this kind has been found at any other site dating to this time period. So in other words, you've got painted pottery as well. That's more important than the first pint of beer, surely. This ancient beer would not have been like the Indian pale ale that we have today. What? I bet it tasted horrible. Shut up. Whoa. Hey, no. Shut up. Shut your face. It was li li likely a slightly fermented and sweet beverage. See, it's not sour. You were wrong, uh, which was probably cloudy in colour. Uh, a bit like something that somebody makes it, um, and sticks it under the, the sink for a month and it, and it looks really dodgy. Uh, the pots were found in, in a 10 foot high mound surrounded by a man made ditch. How did they know men dug it? It could have been women. The yeah. mound contained two human <laughs> skeletons and multiple pits filled with pottery, many of which were, um, were complete vessels. Now, I like this next one, right? Do you, know, do you know what? There's been so much many discovered. Ah, that's one thing I did last week. If any of you watches my uh, my Thursday lecture, do you know when I did a top 10 thing of a jig last week, right? Yeah. Uh, top 10 of the, the, you know, whatever. And then we yeah. that would really work, right? So I thought because because most of my people were away on Thursday, um, because they all buggered off to a, um, an archaeology company meal, um, I decided to do the most the 10 most spectacular finds made um, in 2021 and do you know what right the, i had not come across any of them from a slate from from uh, from, um, from some of the earliest footprint carvings in the world um, to evidence of leather work in, in north africa to um, slave um, tags to um, sort of wonderful um, evidence of human footprints in New Mexico is loads of stuff. Anyways, 10 of them. Uh, this is really interesting. 
Will King John's lost treasure come out in the wash? Sorry. Because it was lost in the wash, you see? So, yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. Just forget it, all right? Yeah. A metal detectorist believes he has found the long lost treasure of King John on a farm near Lincolnshire. If he's found it, right? Why? What? How can he believe he's found it? He's a he's a hundred percent certain that he's found it. Well, why hasn't he? Oh, forget it. Anyway, uh, the crown jewels uh, were lost uh, in October the twelfth, twelve sixteen, during a crossing of the Wash, an estuary that divides Lincolnshire and Norfolk. So he, he was running away with the treasure. There he was, um, and. The, this metal detector enthusiast, who's a mechanical engineer, right, has found lots of artifacts, um, like little bits of buckle and um, you know bronze statues of Lloyd George, those types of things. Um, and he's reckoned that these these this evidence he's been finding might lead him to find the gold, silver, and emeralds and sapphires and rubies. But he's saying, right, that because Emeralds and sapphires are not gold and silver. That's why you haven't found them. But they are definitely there. The biggest mm. attraction of the area is <coughs> the detectorists, and lots of silver has been found. Mm. Um, but it, it, but they haven't actually found it. They, they reckon that there's 120, 120 pounds of silver coins out there somewhere, uh, but they still haven't found it. So there we go. Uh, right, let, let's just do two. Uh, let's. Yeah, we, I, did I mention this, the, this Cambridgeshire body that was found that, that they found the first evidence of Britain of a crucifixion? No, no, no. I want to be crucified, and so does my wife. <laughs> crucifixion. It, it's a doddle. Anyway, by Monty Python. Crucifixion is a doddle. Don't say that. Crucifixion is very nasty. Uh, the world's best example of a Roman crucifixion has been found in an ancient settlement in the UK. The grisly find of a young man's skeleton with a three-inch nail driven into his heel was revealed by in an excavation. But I worked out that the excavation was in 2017. Nobody chose to actually uh, wonder why there's a nail in the heel of this individual in, the, in a box. Until they started looking at it, oh my God, there's a nail in the person's heel. Therefore, that, that's evidence of crucifixion. Right. And they reckon that this actually dates to uh, maybe sometime around 130 years AD. And it might have been a punishment. And the idea is, is that you, you only use one nail and it's nailed into a board. And then you're strapped onto the board. Um, and the nail itself stops you getting off the board because it's nailed into your heel. You can't get off the board, so heads. They only you only need to use one nail in crucifixion. So there you go. Yeah, anyway, you just uh, trot on it. I trot on a nail once. Don't I talk absolute the... rubbish. You're not, gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna. You're not gonna. You're not gonna. You're not gonna let a three-inch nail go through your your heel, are you? Well, not on purpose, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, but you just said you trod on one. I trod I on the on nail, a but I, I wasn't looking where I was going. No, I thought you did it deliberately. I tell <laughs> you what, right? Do you know what? Do you know what the most painful thing in the world is, right? Is, is treading on, on some Lego in your children's room. Right, that is painful. <laughs> and do, you know what, do you know what I did once? I had a drill, right, a hammer drill, and I dropped it and it went straight through my foot. Ooh. And oh. I pulled it out. And it was fine. Uh, right, hang on a minute. One, uh, two more, yeah. Now, oh, here we go. This is, uh, we're talking about the Vassa now today. So this is relevant. Acid is slowly eating away at timbers of the Mary Rose. Oh. Um, um, so basically, they're talking about it is, it is caused by specks of iron and sulfur. They're invisible to the naked eye, but were did detectable using microscopes so the basically they they're using um oh god we we did it they um they, they they're using a solution on the timbers uh, in regards to the newport ship to stop uh, the acid decay on the timbers of the newport ship but obviously they didn't do this um when they were conserving the mary rose 
Um, and it, it goes on to say, centuries spent under the sea saw the um, uptake of harmful iron and sulfur specks by the hull, which were, which were produced through degrade degradation of metal uh, fixtures and artifacts of anaerobic sulfur, reducing bacteria respectively. Exposure to oxygen has led to the formation of acidic um, uh, um, specimens that could... Species! The what? Acidic species. That's what that says. Specimens. Acidic species that could cause greater damage. Um, and here we go. Um, bison uncover 1,000-year-old carving in rock. A herd of bison um, dust bathing in a park in central Canada have unearthed a 1,000-year-old cluster of rock carvings fulfilling an indigenous prophecy. Well, what do you expect when you give a prowl to dig? Sorry. The petroglyphs were noticed by Ernie Walker um, in, in Wanaskawenin Duda effort in Canada. Um, brushing dust away revealed more, more markings on the initial rock, a 5,500 pound boulder. Um, and they're basically, they found all these wonderful petroglyphs on there. I just want to work out. So these petroglyphs date to a thousand years old. Um, and there's carvings. Hang on, blah, blah, blah. There's carvings of a bison's rib cage. What? Mm. Um, and various other things. Um, and then finally, this, this is quite odd. I, has anyone had this experience? Not with Roger. Um, Grandpa's oh. old sword is a Bronze Age treasure. Here we go. Albert Beisman, a digger driver, was working at a gravel pit near the Rhine in the 1950s when he unearthed a bronze sword that looked like something out of an Asterix comic. For, fix for 65 years, Grandpa's old Roman sword lay half forgotten in the attic. How can it lay half forgotten? Do you know what I mean? It's either forgotten or it's not. <laughs> Until Beisman's grandson oh, took it to the state archaeology office out of curiosity. The sword turned out to be a late Bronze Age artifact cast nearly 3,002 years ago. Experts believe it may have been consigned to the water as an offering to a god. They always say that. Mm. The sword was probably made in the final decades of the Urnfield culture. Oh, please. Uh, basically associated with the late Mycenaean period in Greece. You tell these people about the Urnfield culture, and nobody has a sudden idea what you're on about. The sword might never have come to light, but the pa uh, but because of the pandemic. Uh, Twelve months ago, Beisman's grandson, Christian, was tied in the house at the start of Germany's second lockdown. He found the sword and decided to, to use it to tell his children, the story of St. Martin, a Roman soldier who cut his cloak in half to share it with a beggar. <clears throat> Experts in Bonn later told him that the sword predated not only the Roman invasion of the region, but was older than the city of Rome itself. Created um, in about the 800s, so it'd be about 50 years before the foundation of Rome in 700, 753 years B, uh, BC, it was cast in one piece probably for a high status warrior. They always say that. Uh, many scholars believe the weapons were primarily uh, for show and rarely used, really. Uh, the one, however, had clear, clearly been dented in battle and then deliberately bent in the middle, rendering it useless as a weapon. Experts believe it was probably offered as a sacrifice to a local deity. Nice. So actually, that, that's, that's a nice article because... Um, that article leads us on to what we're going to be doing next year. Right, so what I need to do now is we're going to go on to the VASA. And uh, and good of you to join us, Jessica and Claire. I, I reckon Claire. Claire and Jessica out, out in the pool. That's because they're late. That's what it is. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> right, let's just... Um, let's just... Let's just go... What, what am I? What am I doing? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, sorry. Do you know when I? Do you know when I start on time? I'm the foggiest. What I'm doing? The mm -hmm. massive shit. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's what we're doing. Sorry, I knew there was something. Um, I, I've 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 lost the plot. But yeah. yeah. Right. 
Shut up, Rog. Are you, are you seeing this beautiful image? Look at that. Yeah. Oh. Wowzer. Wowzer. Hey, who used to say wowzer? Was it um, a danger mouse? No, it was me. No, <laughs> danger mouse used to say it. Oh. David Jason used to do da da danger, uh, danger mouse's voice. True. <laughs> that is true, honestly. Um, ask Gina, she knows all about danger mouse. <laughs> Right. Okay. Right. I, I, I would, would help if I knew what I was doing. Right. Okay. The Vasa. Right. We've all heard of the Vasa. Uh, you can actually pronounce it with a W, but it's the Vasa. V A S A. The Vasa. It's a, it's a Swedish warship that went to sea and sank the same day. That's why it's so well preserved. Um, and it was built between 1626 and 1628. Uh, and it sailed for um, it sailed for uh, just under a mile, one thousand three hundred meters into a maiden voyage and sank on the tenth of August, sixteen twenty-eight. Mm. So, uh, can you imagine? The captain said, "I got a bit of a sinking feeling, boys." Right. Anyway, oh. what I'm going to do is give you some facts. Right. So, um, it it's yeah, it, uh, it's um. It's beam. We know what the beam is, don't we? From starboard to port. Starboard? No, starboard to port. Basically, the width of the vessel. That, that's called the beam. Um, that was 11.7 metres. Right, so that, that's, that's a start. Right, that's good. Um, it's, it's displacement. So when it's placed into the water, the weight that's displaced is 1,210 tonnes. So that, that's another fact. Um, when it when it went down, they basically forgot about it, but it was lifted in 1961. Um, oh. The only things missing from it were its cannons. It had it had it had 64 cannons altogether, 64 guns altogether. Uh, 40. Um, it had uh, 48 24 pounder guns, which are quite heavy, and then much smaller ones, which would have been sort of on the. Um, Power the aft, which would be three pounders. There were eight of them, and a one pounder, which was basically two of them. And they had six howitzer guns, uh, which is probably a different type of howitzer than, than we're talking about, which we used in the Second World War. Little cannons. Um, so that that's did have we done the length? All oh, right. So okay. Um, so so basically, um, have I got a length? Yeah, the length is is um, just under seventy meters. From proud to after 70 meters, 70, 60, 69, actually, 69 meters. That mm -hmm. actually makes it sound more if you do 226 feet. That makes it like whatever. So the height, basically, from the keel to the crow's nest um, is 52.5 meters in height. Yeah, that gives you an idea. So, so it, 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 right. It, it was wow in the water. This, this was this was wow factor, right? And you're getting wow factor in that image. Look at that. Oh, whoa. that is a ship. And, uh, and basically, it's something that um, the Swedish are very, very proud of. They, they, they love this vessel, right? It, it, it's it's Belanger. It's Belanger, le route along le plan de square. It's, it, it's the... That, that's French, by the way, not Swedish. Um, oh. it, it, it's it's the type of ship, and, and the thing is, the bronze cannon was the bronze cannons that were on board, not iron cannons, bronze cannons. Bronze cannons are a lot uh, better uh, than than iron cannons, right? Uh, because they they've got a less less explosion rate on first impact, uh, for the first use, uh, and the cannons were mainly all taken off in the 1600s. When they found it, it was so well preserved that they thought, right, we've got to lift this and we're going to stick it in a museum. So that's what they did. The hull itself, well, when you think about it, um, it, it basically everything below the sails is and the rigging was more or less intact as it is. Um, so, so it was largely intact. Um, and they built one museum for it. And they built then in 1988... Uh, they, they built the Vassa Museum and it basically was in a shipyard for ages anyway until that 1988. And it's recognised as one of Sweden's greatest treasures. And why not? 
yeah, you know, when, when we think about it, you know, we, we've got like the um, um, Mary Rose and the um, SS Great Britain, and, and we've got like um, HMS Victory, yeah. And then we in Wales have, have got um, the Newport ship, and what have you got in Cumbria? Nothing, but it's not my <laughs> fault. But anyway, the point is, is that um, the point is, is that this is the pride and joy of the Swedish state. It's sort of used for loads. They've actually, they've actually done a reconstruction, right? I'll just show you now. Oh God, there, there is a reconstruction there somewhere. Oh, there it is. There she is. Oh, doesn't she look cool? Oh. Well, actually, she, she's ah. not. Shut up, you. She's she's not exactly the she's not exactly a total reconstruction, but she's a sort of reconstruction of thingamajigs, right? She's like she's like it, right? So, uh, because if you if you look at the um, if you look at the art, it is slightly different, right? Because oh, if right. you go back to the reconstruction, right? Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's slightly different, but but that's how it sort of looked, you know. Um, that's how it sort of looked. And this is this is uh, this is what the Japanese took their money into. But that, that's something else. We'll, we'll leave the Japanese there for now. We, you know, they, they, they get in the way of it. Um, so um, this itself is, is something very, very special. And it's recognized as one of the greatest sort of shipwrecky type things anywhere on the planet. Um, and it's. It's it's had mm -hmm. millions and millions of visitors visitors since it was uh, first uh, made available to visitors in since 1961. Up to 50, uh, up to 35 million people have visited it. So the the Vassar itself is is an intriguing vessel. It, it's whenever you look at um, whenever you look at the, like Viking shipwrecks, this always comes up. It's not a Viking shipwreck at all because it, it dates from um, it dates from its first uh, voyage in. Um, uh, 1628. Hmm. Uh, it was built on the orders of Gustav Adolphus, who was actually the, the then the king of Sweden, and the and the, the Sweden itself was, was going places. You know, you never think of Sweden as being like um, a big, um, huge, powerful nation, but but it had its times. Um, there there it was there it was massively involved in wars with Poland and Lithuania and and Russia and Scandinavia. Uh, it was one of those countries that, that was all out. And, and strangely enough, so, um, in the Napoleonic War, the Swedish had, the Swedish had some of the, had a really good reputation, rep, um, the Swedish had a good um, reputation as being really good uh, fighters on, on the battlefields of, of Europe um, at the time of the Napoleonic Wars in the 1800s. But anyway, richly decorated as a symbol of the king's ambitions for Sweden, and himself, upon completion, she was one of the most powerfully armed vessels in the world. But like the Mary Rose, and not unlike the Mary Rose, it had all these cannons on board. Yeah, you know, imagine the weight of sixty-four cannons. Uh, the displacement on the tons, the tonnage of that is is quite a lot. It went down just like the Mary Rose because it was over overladen. Yeah, Mary Rose went down. Actually, the Mary Rose went down uh, eighty years on earlier. So this was this was the King of Sweden's Mary Rose, basically. Um, and however, um, however, one of the things that we, we do know is it was described that um, um, the Vasa became dangerously unstable, um, too much weight in the upper structure of the hull. And what was there? What was there on the Mary Rose? Too much weight on the upper structure uh, of uh, you know. It was just like. This this is the thing, you you sort of overlate these vessels. Yeah, what what we what we have actually is is some of the the biggest death rates on board ships these days uh, on ferries when they're overladen, um, and, and it's just it's it's just that's unfortunate. Despite this lack of stability, she was ordered to sea and and foundered only a few minutes after encountering a wind stronger than a breeze. So basically. It went, and it just it found it. It started to um, it, it started to go down. Um, what what they did find, what uh, just sort of into the into the sort of um, into this back in the day, the king 
the king, sort of um, King Gustav Adolphus, mm -hmm. did an in, had an investigation under the Swedish Privy Council, and nobody was found responsible for the sinking of the vessel. We oh. do know that we do know that people went down with the vessel, right? Uh, because thousands of artifacts and the, and the remains of at least fifteen people were found in and around the Vassa's hull by marine archaeologists. Fifteen people, in fact. Uh, the Mary Rose had a um, probably a, well had a lot more people on board when it went to sail. Uh, the, the Vassa had 145 sailors, it's believed, and 300 soldiers on board. Um, the evidence that they found is they not all the not all the cannons were taken off. One or two of the smaller ones, I think, were were there. I, not that I think it were were there when I found it. Items of clothing, weapons, tools, coins, cutlery, food. Um, <laughs> And, and basically evidence of six of the ten sails. Amazing. The sails. Wow. And the rigging. Wow. So all this, all this has survived. And the Vasa has undergone continuous uh, work and monitoring um, to keep it ship shape. So, um, so uh, basically, uh, if, we, if we go and basically this is the... Um, um, this is the upper um, transom mm. uh, of the aft. So, so basically, this itself, with with the um, king of Sweden's, you, you can't make it up, can you? It just it doesn't look real, but it is. Um, so, if we think about it, this is nearly four hundred years old, nearly four hundred years old, <clears throat> and um, up until the sixteen hundreds, um, up until the sixteen hundreds. Sweden, early 1600s, um, nobody, nobody thought anything of about Sweden. It was like a little backwater with a couple of people um, who liked spending time with elks. Um, and that was it. But between 1611 and 1718, and obviously this vessel comes in in 1628, Sweden decided that we're going to have a bit of that. And they decided to, they decided they wanted to be a world power to dominate the Baltic. And again, by the 1800s, they were definitely quite a big player. Yeah, they were a really big player. What I'm going to do, actually, to give you an idea of this, you know, we, we when have we had a lecture about Sweden? Never. Never. We don't do Sweden. Nobody ever does Sweden. There you go. Uh, there, there, there we go. There it is. Uh, what, what, what have we got there? Hang on a minute. I, I've got to get my dude uh, out. I got to get my little map on you to know what I'm doing. Hang on, go on. There, there, right, good, excellent. So, um, so basically, um, actually, my no my notes are saying is that um, Sweden was sparsely populated, poor, and peripheral, uh, but it was only until about 1611 that they started to expand. But when you look at that, right, the green area, the dark green on there, there is the the empire as it looked in 1560. That looks quite chunky, actually. Got to be honest with you. Um, and then, um, good old Gustav, uh, he, he started to sort of um, obtain these territories, uh, not only um, not only on the sort of Scandinavian peninsula, but actually um, on on the sort of um, in in the realms of um, the old Russian world as well. Um, and th there you go. It's sort of it, it's keeping over Livonia. That's a good one. Uh, just about north of Lith Lithuania there. So by 1654, so the sink of this ship really didn't do anything to his, his sort of um, sort of bent of acquisitions. Um, and there you could see the, you know what I mentioned about, uh, you know what I mentioned about the Swedish and I mentioned about Napoleon. Um, and when you think about it, this is the Napoleon war period, 1809. Um, so, you know, they, they've got this big chunk of sweet uh, Finland and, there we go. They've got all these bits of territory um, in Europe as well, um, just sort of um, southeast of Denmark. So, you know, they, they, they go in places and they even snatch earlier on a big chunk of Norway. So just when you think about it, if, uh, if the Swedish would have kept going, the Swedish would have been one of the biggest empires in Europe. I just thought I'd say that because it sounded good. Mm. So... 
Yeah. So what? What a bit, bit of background. I don't want to do too much because I, I, I want to. Um, I don't want to do too much about the Swedish state. I just wanted to. But mind you, we don't talk about Sweden, so why not? Yeah. Wow. Um, and one, one of the things that the, the Swedish needed to do. Um, one of the one of the things that the Swedish needed to do was that um, to to have this sense of might. Um, yeah, they needed to build big <coughs> warships because you can't get really. You can't walk around the Baltic. Put it that way. You need ships. Yeah, you need you needed you needed proper ships. So, um, so um, sixteen twenty eight was the year, right? Which followed on naturally from sixteen twenty seven, when they they when they had a when they had a war uh, with the Polish, right? So they had a war with the Polish, and it was it was a catastrophic defeat. Uh, it was a catastrophic defeat for the Swedish in 1627, right? So they um, they they basically um, they they lost one of their they they lost what two of their prize prize galleons. One sank and one captured, and they had 304 dead or whatever. There was there was this sea battle, and like all down in history, right? We're not going to let this stand. So what they decided to do, when you've got a bit of a defeat in history, we're going to go out there and we're going to we're going to build a massive fleet. So they decided to build a massive fleet so that they could conquer and conquer and conquer. Um, and um, so so basically, this is what they were doing. They, they were a Protestant country. They, they were very sort of uh, as Sweden feared a Catholic conquest. They 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 didn't like. The Catholics, so um, and, and they they were basically very Protestant. They, they they were a Protestant state. So basically, they wanted to build a large navy. They had a small navy up until that point, and they were now building a large navy. So in fact, um, in in sixteen twenty eight, they decided to um, start building mega ships like the Vasa. Um, they they and. The, these these ships they 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 built five ships. One was called the Apple. One was called the Crown. One was called the Scepter, and one was called the Ark of Gothenburg, right? And the other one was called the Vasa. So they they this this was going to be the fleet. This was going to be this was basically what the Germans did after the um, after after the um, armistice of the First World War. They started to build ships like the Bismarck, right, um, and the Grass Bay, right, and and. And yeah, they wanted to. Germany wanted to be big at sea again, right? Because they had been in the First World War, but now they want to build again. It's a bit like the Swedish back uh, in the 1620s. So I think what what I'm going to do, right, is I'm going to. Uh, where, where are we time wise? Oh, it's only eight twenty nine. That's fine. So so what 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 they did? They 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 set to building this in the Stockholm shipyard. Um. And to build something like this, they needed really, really good timber. And that's, you know, when, when we're talking about building ships, we, we never really talk about, you know, where the timber's coming from, right? We just like think, oh, right, timber's going to be there. But to build something of this scale, right, you need really good timber. You need to get out there and sort of the, the keel itself, you know, you need a really nice, firm keel, okay? So the keel itself um, it was um, for, well, hang on, I'll just make sure I got my um so that's gonna be hang on, make sure I got my keel keel right. So blah, 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 right, yeah, so right, length. The keel alone was was 41 meters in length. Right. Um, uh, um so we got hang on, we got 41 meters in length. Yeah, that's that one. Got that. Um, and then basically from around Sweden, they, they needed to go out buying the wood from estates around the Swedish landscape. So obviously people with rich estates, um, they needed to um, gather as much timber as they possibly can to actually to build the keel and uh, all the rest of it to get, get going on this. And they started laying the foundation of the ship in, in the dockyard in February and March 1628. So obviously we know it's going to be out to sea at 16, uh, 1626. Sorry, 1626. And it's going to be out at sea uh, by 1628 so so but it, they took a long time to actually get get going with it um, and actually even though it it was a very very well built vessel right let's go on to another image oh look at that it's, it's like um 
I, I know um, I know Gina's got a little version in a bottle on a, on a mantelpiece, right? And you're looking at this, you're thinking, no, this is just like, how? Why? This is just Whoa. so well preserved, you know? It's, it's there. It's amazing. Um, and interesting enough, when you, when you think about it, it, it's built a little bit um, uh, to um, towards the aft there. You, you get you you get like little sort of it looks more or less castle like, right? Um, and the rigging rig, rigging is really well developed. So you know we mentioned about the Newport ship. We we sort of talked about you know the, the, the 14, um, 1460s, the idea of rigging and and um, you know all that type of stuff. Um, was being developed right so this is this is very very well developed at this stage very very well developed so 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 we're getting into it um they're, they're actually um when you think about it there, there's 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 a fault in the design the um when when they when when they were building this vessel naturally they they wanted to build five other vessels altogether and uh, there, there was a shortage of material uh, it was it was ordered that sailcloth come from France and Holland, right? But eventually, it would be a really good quality sailcloth. But it turned out that the stuff that they actually did find uh, was mostly of hemp and partly of flax, and it was not as good quality as it could have been. And the rigging was actually made of hemp from Latvia. Um, so... And the king constantly, constantly visited the shipyard to see how his, his ships are developing, to see, to see how his, his, his ships are, are, um, are coming into their own. So um, one, one of the things that um, they actually started changing the design of the Vasa. Initially, it was going to be a much smaller vessel, but they decided to lengthen it a bit more. So we, we started off with a, with a 41 metre keel and they decided to add to it. So that's going to probably... Uh, mess around with the stability and it was the king who was ordering the big guns to be mounted on it against probably the advice of the builders um and it had two gun firing decks as you can make out which 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 is a development but obviously uh they, they could have learned something by the by the problems that that you would have seen from other vessels like the mary rose row rose um, and and how that worked or didn't work uh, with the gun decks, um, and having two gun decks compromise the um, having having two gun decks, um, um, it sort of undermined would have eventually undermined the the ability of the vessel um, to be as uh, maneuverable at sea. But there was a compromise between that, and it was like, well, you know, we uh, we can think a bit about seaworthiness, but we, we need these cannons on board. Remember, it's a warship, so people didn't really understand what a warship was. Still, right? We're we're, we're what is it? We're we're a little bit away from Trafalgar at this minute, uh, and people are still sort of learning a little bit more about what what these vessels were all about. Uh, when, when we think about it, we we've got. When we think about the archaeological side of this, this is this is archaeology, living archaeology. We don't have to guess anything. What what we what we're seeing is is what we get. Um, and, and the other thing as well is uh, this was going to be a ship of the line. This was going to be this was going to be the bee's knees. This was going to lead. Um, this was going to lead a fleet or an armada out somewhere. Um, and and this 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 was this was arguably going to be the vessel that, that, that would drive into um, any other fleet and cause havoc. Uh, and this, this was all part of the line of battle tactics of the day. And uh, this, this was meant to scare the enemy. So what, what we're going to, what we're going to do there and ornamentation had a bit, bit of a problem. And then what we're going to do, we're going to look at, um, <coughs> I want to look at the sinking, what, what, how, how it exactly sank. And, and we'll just mention a little bit about the Vasa um, and some of the deterioration of the sea, the recovery. Um, i really like to get on to the finds if we can actually look at the archaeology and the finds. So lots of, you know, I said most of the, the cannons were taken off. They did actually find three cannons, right? So that's great. Um, and what we, you know, the, the, um, 
they actually found a backgammon set, amazingly enough, an old backgammon set. So that's great. It really depends what we got time to do tonight. And um, um, and naturally after this, I got I got um, a two hour journey as well. So uh, um, so I, I've got to um, I, I've got I've got I've got to get somewhere. So um, right, any questions? Uh, we'll 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 have, we'll have a break. Hmm. I, hang on, let, let, let's just stop that. <clears throat> um, right, okay. Um, stop sharing. Right, good. Oh, God. Okay, there. Okay, got it. Go for it. It, it, sounds, ask questions. It, it, sounds as if it, it sounds as if it was built more for its looks than its practicality. Yes. A square rig ship like that would have difficulty negotiating the Skagorak. Mm -hmm. But a Pete, Pete is, is, is meant to break the ranks. They probably weren't thinking about it. The, the, the king didn't have a very clue about cannons. And the other thing as well is um, we, we're not talking about people having a clue about um, naval warfare uh, until probably the dreadnought class vessels in the First World War. They, they, they were still learning about um, combat at sea in the American Civil War when they were building ironclads. So if you're sailing um, in and out from the inner parts of Sweden, it would have to negotiate the Skagorak. Yes. Um, which is difficult a bit in more. itself. That's why we built the, the Kiel Canal. Yes. Because of the, the difficulty negotiating that, that particular bit of sea. So a square ring ship like that would have great difficulty, I would think. Mm. But having yes. to change direction in so many, you know, such wide range of directions, depending upon the wind. When you're square rigged, you can only run before the wind and you can't run very close to the wind as a yacht of the day could. And obviously, it's not a yacht, is it, Pete? It's a, no. it's a, or yeah. a longboat, yeah. yeah. Or a longboat, yeah. Is that rigging that you showed? Is that the original rigging? Uh, they found some original rigging, but I don't think that's going to be. Sure for that time, I would say yes, it is. Yeah. It, 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 well, Pete, it's not going to be complete, but th that is the style, and they did that's find the style some that would have been used. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, obviously, some there is some re uh, reconstruction work on it, but they did actually find some rigging anyway. It's just obviously not all of what you see is actually no original. It wouldn't originally have been painted. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, really? no, no. You're jumping ahead. We, we've got uh, uh, we, we've we we we've got a um, an image of a cabinet, right, which mm. shows a load of um, pigments and oh, the pigments yeah. that were actually used in painting the ship. It was it was it was colourful like the one that we saw at the like beginning. Construction, gosh. Yeah. I, 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 by by the way, I've got to I've got to get up to Brecon right tonight mm -hmm. because there's a solstice celebration in the in Brecon, right? Um, with my mate Johnny Nymer. So I, that's why I've got to get up to Brecon tonight. Oh, you're gonna wear a robe. Look what I get up to. I'm sorry, <laughs> Margaret. Right, you're getting very <laughs> personal tonight. What I do with my robe, right, is my own business. And if I want to run across a field naked, it's my choice. But you can join me sometime. I've got a very vivid imagination. You've got plenty of time for the sunrise. <laughs> That's the point of the solstice, isn't it? The sunset and the sunrise. Oh. Yeah, but I didn't say I had to leave this minute, did I? I said I had to go. I don't, not this minute. God, You've got I plenty of time, as I'm saying. You've got all night. There's no panic. Look. Yeah, but I, I, I it's didn't the say I... It's the shortest day. Oh, shortest shut day. up. <laughs> you, I tell you what, right? No wonder I don't like giving live lectures anymore. It just... it just I get so many numpties in my classes. Oh, you love it. Oh, I do actually love it. I do actually love it. You know, I do actually love it. I, I, I do. I do. I do. Right, okay. Right, any, right, who else has got any... Claire, you've got any questions? No. Uh, Dirty Rog, what have you got questions for? By the way, Roger, check. 
Who? Yeah, that's good. Uh, Andy, anything you want to say? <coughs> no. There's Claire. My God, we've got Claire. Hey. Hey. Hello, no, Claire. 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 Claire didn't Hello. believe you when I said that uh, most of us missed her. Um, and, uh, and the one that didn't miss her was John, but well, I don't miss John either. Anyway, I thought I'd wind you all up. Claire, any, any, uh, anything you want to say, lovely? No, sorry. We have missed you. Thank you. We haven't seen you for weeks. Well, I've been ill. Oh, oh, oh dear. Yeah, but you've been ill. Then I, then I was working. You could have at least sat there and listened. Yeah. Claire, 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 can I ask you a very personal question? This is between me and you. Nobody else has to hear it, right? How yeah, do you no eat problem. any of the mince pies in Asda, and are they any good? Extra special ones are good. Yeah, you've always got to go for it. Are they, are they nice and moist? Because you've missed my. Um, basically, I've got some. Uh, I got some festive mince pies here, and they're really nice, moist centers, right? So we we did a moist test earlier. Are they really moist in the center? Because that's a really good mince pie. The ones at Costco is quite nice as well, Carl. Yeah, yeah but that, that's because you yesterday you didn't give me any. Thanks a lot. Apparently, the Aldi ones won an award. Did they? Mm -hmm. Hang on. My mum likes the Aldi's ones, clear as right. Oh, shut up. Right, okay. okay. All right. Claire. Claire, Jessica, anything else you want to say? No? What the yeah. hell's going on there? Right, Claire. Well done. Just a normal night shift. Yeah, they're a bunch of numpties. I am winding up. <laughs> I think he wants a fight. I'm gonna I'm gonna send Jessica in there. We'll, we'll, we'll duff him up. Right, okay. Um anyone um, else wanna yes, anyone else please. What's um, that? if they're a boat building nation, why did they make such a big mistake with that boat? No, no, hang on a minute. They they initially in the 1500s, they they they, they were a bit of a backwater compared to Norway, right? Um, no, make the Vikings were seamen leaders. Hang yeah. on, hang on, I haven't finished. Exactly. I haven't finished. I haven't finished. By, um, <laughs> by the 1500s, they were a bit of a backwater because the, the old days of the Vikings were, were come and gone. The, remember the Swedish Swedish Vikings were the ones who, 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 who had links with the Byzantine Empire. These are the ones that, that founded the dynasty of, of the Tsars of Russia. But by, by, by the 1500s, it was a bit of a backwater. But coming into the 1600s, the Swedish looked towards their naval past. And they saw that their naval past was the way that they could dominate the Baltic. And they definitely did. However, however, you, you could also say the same, Drina, a foreign nation of sailors, right? Why did we make the same mistake with the Mary Rose? Why did the Spanish make the same mistake with the, Sp uh, with the Spanish Armada? Why did Drake make the same mistake with the English Armada? It's the mm. same thing, Drina. Yeah. Well, we always yeah. thought big ear is better, but it not it's always the, is. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. It? Uh, but basically, the, the, in the American Civil War, the, the, uh, the clash between the uh, Monitor and uh, I think it was a Merrimack, wasn't it? And uh, they, they were the first sort of... Um, um, sort of ironclad vessels uh, 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 in the American Civil War. Uh, they 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 thought, okay, we'll have we'll have smaller vessels converted from uh, wooden vessels. Uh, in, they they put uh, iron cladding all over them and all the rest of it, and, uh, and they, they were they were overladen. There were put all these cannons on there, uh, and it, it's just it's just all that thing throughout history. Did you know there was um, there was a vessel that was that was that was went that was designed and went to sea. Right. Um, I think, yeah, no, it was a submarine. It had a cannon on it, right? A huge cannon. Um, and it just sank uh, because they thought uh, big cannons on submarines, big cannons on ships are going to really do, do the bit. And unfortunately, as Peter said, bigger is not better in regards to vessels. As, as we saw with the HMS Hood, uh, that just went down like a, like a pack of cards in the scarf of Butter Flow. Uh, and just be, the big vessels is not always the way. Because of the advent of the uh, metal-clad vessels, 
That's why the Palliser shell was developed for the uh, rifle muzzle loading cannon that we they yes. put on Plateau Island. Yeah, but yeah. whether they whether they would have ever seen a French vessel of that class? Well, they probably did. They well, we never did because they've never fired in anger. No, no. They, that's why they were developed to uh, penetrate the better metal clad vessels. Yes, wow. that's true. That's true. Uh, so, anyone else want to ask anything? Because we're gonna have a break. Jessica, do you want to come up to Brecon with me and um, go 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 to the solstice, and where we can we can run around with Josh naked? I know, I know. I I done my own little celebration today, in oh, some that's sort good. of way. Oh, that, that that's good. That's good. Uh, you know. Okay, I'll just do it with Josh. You won't mind. Yeah, uh, you, 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 yeah. Go and get Josh. I'm sure he'd love it, Carl. I'm sure he'd uh, love yeah, no, stuff me, at all. Me, me and Josh are men of the world. We would love it. I think. Yeah. Cool. Uh, right, okay, let's have a break, folks. Okie dokie. Okay. Okie dokie. See you later. Oh, I, hang on, I'm going to read the, this chat thing because they're usually interesting. Largest ever millipede found have been found on a Northumberland beach today. Uh, ooh. What? Millipede. Oh, yeah, it's several feet long, isn't it? Yeah, it would need to. Yeah, apparently it's got 1,200 legs or something. Yeah. And it's a real millipede. Mm. I thought I thought when I said it's a real millipede, it had like a million legs, but no, it's got 1,200. Well, a thousand is a million. A mill, yeah, isn't it? A mill. Oh, a shut mill up. Is a thousand. All right, yeah, fair enough. All right, okay. Yeah, get get your point, right? Yeah, yeah, I tell you what, right, Pete, why did you shave your hair, right? Because you, you got really cocky since your hair no, started. Look, I got hair there. Look, look. Yeah, I know you have. That's what worries me. <laughs> it makes you look vaguely intelligent. Only vaguely, that's good. <laughs> vaguely, vague, vaguely intelligent. But we're having a break now. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put something on. Oh, you know, I said about the island off Sweden that's got lots of stones and things. It's Gotland. I couldn't remember what it was called. No, Gotland. No, Gut no, Gotland. Gotland. Yeah, that's the one. And they found uh, the biggest hoard of Viking silver anywhere. Good. And loads of other stuff as well. Do you know, do you know what? We really want to get, do you know, what we really want to get, I, I tell you what, like, what we're going to do that. We're going to see if we can pronounce some of the good and stuff. We're going to do that. Yeah. Um, I, those those I, I, islands I, are the deobstructions of the Skagorak. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's it basically just off the Swedish coast. These weird blooming islands of Gotland, Gotland, uh, and it goes up. Gotland um, is near a village called VSP. Uh, outside VSP is mainly Denmark. Yeah, VSP, VSP. Um, there's a pop. Uh, um, they've got archaeological evidence going back nine thousand two hundred years. Mm. Uh, and the island is the home to the goods and sites such as Eadbeet um, <laughs> show that it had been occupied since prehistoric times. I did notice that the southern tip of Sweden was yeah. owned by Carl the Tenth. Oh, I'm related to him. Carl the Tenth, yeah. yeah Spelled yeah. like you with a K. Yeah, K. K, yeah, K. one of your ancestors, clearly. Yeah, definitely, definitely is, definitely is, definitely is, definitely is, definitely is. Right, okay. We, we, yeah, we are. I gotta put the kettle. No, good. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I, I, I gotta mute myself because I've, I've, I, I, I've been, I've been, yeah, cool. I'm gonna Do have you know? a Bailey's if that's all right. Who's Dan? Basically, what? Well, hang on. Here's another one, Margaret. Yeah. Who's Dan of the Deep? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to do a whole lecture on Sweden talking like that. Yeah, I, I would love to do it. I, there's one woman in my in my um, um, Bridgen class only used to come to the classes because I, I used to speak like that. <laughs> hey, Carl, don't insult the Scandinavians. I got to my hey, theory. shut up, Rog. Hey, hey, Rog. Rog. I got to do a sense and I get it. It's all the Vyrt, 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 vyrt. So it's but very good. You respect my voice. Oh, you there. Right, okay. Um, don't kill the elks. Right, okay, I'll be back. 
I'll be back. Oh. So that was fun. How are you hand anyway? Are you standing up? No. Well, I've got a joke if you want to hear it. Yeah, yeah, go on then. Give it your give it your best. Go on. Andrew Moore was interviewing Boris and said, What's your favorite lie? And Boris said, I don't tell lies. <laughs> um, Andrew Moore said, Yeah, I like that one too. The best. <laughs> God. Uh, right, all right, Dan. I gotta finish my tea. That's terrible.
I wonder if we're going to have a white Christmas. I don't think so. No? No, it's uh, yeah. getting milder. Thankfully. It's very mild today, isn't yeah. it? Very still. There wasn't a warm, breath of high, wind. High pressure's coming in again. Nice yeah. Water. Southern wind's in, good. <laughs> I'm fed up of taking the dog for walk and getting my feet all muddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And he jumps up and I get it all over my trousers as well. Yeah, right. Does he have a coat as well? Does he have a coat? Yeah, Aussie, yeah. No, it, just when it's raining, he has a little red coat. Oh, I see. Yeah. What about cold but they, they, don't really, they don't really need coats, dogs. They've already got one, haven't they? Well, of course they have. On the breed, are yeah. <laughs> Oh, Pete, I like your hat. Yeah. <clears throat> I've taken my, my little thing off now. It was making my head itch. I've got a red one somewhere, but this is a blue one. Yeah, you're not colour coordinated. It's, no, uh, not it's not good enough. Oh, you've got yellow socks on. Oh, good. Right. So there we go. It's got VK on it, so I think it's a Viking app. Ah. <laughs> 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 What are you doing on Christmas Day, Pete? Have you got family coming to visit? Well, no, I'm going to my daughter's. Oh, nice. But there's only two doors away. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. I have to cook the goose. Oh, do you? Yes. <laughs> A goose? Yes. Oh. And, and the pudding. Yeah. And the stuffing. Oh, right. How do you do your stuffing? Is it just... Paxo stage station onion, or do you do? No, it's not. No, you do a proper homemade one. It, it's yeah, it's it's the sausage meat from my local butcher who make their own. Yeah, uh, it it is with sage and onion yet, but also uh, other uh, fried onions mm. and garlic. Very nice. Yeah. Sounds yummy. Well, Lime with bacon, me. smoked bacon. Yeah. Right. A friend of mine said um, her daughter's partner works at Sizer Castle Estate and every year they cull so many of the deer. And uh, he'd said to my friend, would you like some venison? She said, oh, yes, that would be, that would be nice. So he didn't just bring a joint, he brought the whole deer, oh, complete with the skin, the hair, it just minus the head. Oh. And um, and they said, we can butcher it for you if you like. So she said, oh, all right then. So they, it was just a young deer, not a huge one. So oh. it was hoisted onto the kitchen table and they took the skin off and butchered it all. And mm -hmm. it's now in their freezer. Wow. Can you imagine? Oh, God. Mm -hmm. And they're vegetarians. Oh, her, daughter, okay. her daughter and partner are both Fred vegetarians, but they don't mind doing the butchering. Oh, that's a bit that strange. Odd? That's odd, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Mm. Never tried venison, but it's, it's a stronger taste than beef. Is that right? I've never, I've never had venison ever. No. No. I'm just told it's a very, very strong. Flavor. I don't think yeah. I would like it. Apparently, it is. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I've had pheasant ones, which I seem to remember was quite nice. Mm. 
Yeah. And it's funny, I only like turkey at Christmas. I'm not really bothered about it the rest of the year. Mm. It's a bit bland, isn't it? Well, well that's why you have to make it less, less dry. There's so many people cook it dry with your can, space it mm. and things, but apparently to the people mold this. It's nice with cranberry more, sauce. More, yeah. mm. But I have chicken, I think, turkey anyway. Mm. The bread for the breast meat, you see. Yeah. And to me, which is very bland, and I don't like it, to be honest with you. Mm. I prefer the thighs and the legs. Yeah, a bit more flavour in there. Perhaps much more flavour, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. Fine, I'm the same with chicken as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, well, well. A goose I've never tried. It's, is it? No, I've never had a goose. Stronger taste, Pete, and a bit greasy, or it's a darker meat, right? More flavoursome. It used to be the traditional fair one, time, didn't it? Well, of course it was. You know, goose but turkeys before. are not natural to this country; they're, well, they're Americans. American. After the war, I expect. And everything changed. Oh, well, long after the war, I would have thought. Mm. But uh, a lot of people came in and. Changes to the language, the American influence, different things. Was, uh, we bred chickens and uh, and geese for Christmas. Mm. And one of, my, one of my jobs uh, coming up to Christmas was plucking the uh, geese and the chickens. Because we supplied half a Falmouth Docks workers with with chickens and geese for their oh. Christmas dinner. Mm. <clears throat> oh. My aunt would kill them all, and then we would have to... Uh, Pluck them, but with geese, to pluck them is difficult. We would have to uh, dip them in boiling water mm. to, set, oh, right. yeah, to to make it easier to actually pluck them because they were very difficult to pluck. Yeah. Mm. I think if I had to kill the beasts myself, I'd probably be a vegetarian. I wasn't a <laughs> pheasant plucker. I was a, a pheasant plucker as <laughs> man. <laughs> I, I was. Didn't want to say that. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to put that in. Yeah, I was tempted and I thought, well, you know. Oh, time to start work, Paul Claire. Hi. Hi, Hi Claire. Claire. Happy Christmas. Do your spiel now, Claire. Talk to us. Hope you have a nice rest. Yeah. I am. I'm a. I've only got Christmas Day off. Oh, um, heck. <laughs> well, enjoy it, whatever. Yeah, you enjoy. So, thank Claire, you. Lovely seeing you all again. And Claire, yeah, I'll just like to, before you go, Claire. Before you go, Claire. Next next Tuesday, it's a pre-recorded class, so that'll be online, and uh, okay. we'll be we'll be back properly on the fourth of January. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye Claire. Bye. Right Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, at least she joined us today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you know? Do you know what? Before we start, now I'm going to have another one of these these mince pies. Now, now uh, again, uh, look at that there. Go on. Uh, oh, shocking! I hope you're going to keep the good clean. It'll be clagging all your teeth up. Oh God! Oh. You have to do extra flossing. I don't do shop mince pies. I make my own. Yeah. yeah but this is, but Pete, this is so moist. <laughs> Has it got brandy in it? Well, I'm going to be gliding. Gly <laughs> oh, I tend God. to put whiskey in my mince pies. Yeah. Brandy in my pudding. Oh. All oh, right. Very good. Mm. No, there's no alcohol in these ones, thank you very much. Well, well I mean, that's not back anyway, so. They got uh, suet in. No, they got brandy butter. Oh, Christ. Mm. 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 Um, yeah, veg vegetable suet. Oh, that's all right then. How can you have vegetable suet? Well, it's either that's... suet or it's not. <laughs> that's bloody ridiculous. 
Uh, I got something that's going to wind Peter up now. Hang on a minute. A friend, a friend of mine called Kylie. She bought me these. It's called Tuno. Right, oh, it's tins uh -huh. of Tuno. Right, and it's Tuno spring water with natural sea salt added. So she bought these for me, and I said I can't eat that. And it's basically, um, it's basically vegetarian tuna. Oh, but Tech, that if you're vegetarian, why do you want something that's like tuna? Textured <laughs> soy protein, Please. spring water, um, vegan fish flavor. Uh. And so it's basically vegetarian um, tuna. Oh. But if you, if you want fish flavor, <laughs> you want fish. fish. <laughs> if you're a vegetarian, you don't want fish flavor. It <laughs> tastes good anyway. Some do. You might like the taste of fish, but you might not want fish being killed in the process. Yeah. 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 It's a well. weaning process. Isn't uh, Adam, it? Adam, let's get this straight, right? You know, men who want women, right? But they don't actually want a physical woman, so they get a blow-up rubber doll. It's the same thing. Oh, we did notice in the back of the minibus, didn't we? Yeah, but the right. little girl, the little girl who saw it said, "Oh, look, Daddy, it's got boobies." <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. All right, let's get on with the lecture now. <laughs> <laughs> that was a true story. That one. Oh. Yeah. Uh, all right then. As you know Peter, your ways by calling out for John. As Pete's mentioned, this what I did, right? I shaved off my beard, right? And I got some glue, right? And I put the glue under his armpits and in other parts of the body, right? Oh. And unfortunately, the glue hadn't dried. So when when Anne and Dorothy went to dress it with knickers and everything, it was still wet. Oh. I'm not yeah. going any further with that. <laughs> Right, okay, let, let's let us let us get straight. Let's get back to where we were. Oh, God, we're never going to get this done tonight. Right, okay. Um, okay. Uh, it's your fault. It's your, your fault, Rog. I know, good. Pe people, people pay good money to watch this bloody uh, palaver. That's the matter. Oh. Right, right. That's John, isn't it? Who? John on top of the on top of the decking. John. 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 No, John. 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 Mod model of the cross section of it there. Doesn't it look great? Mm. Love it. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah, fair enough. A model. John. Right, so ba basically, um the, the armaments as we know. The Vasa was built during a time that the, the, the okay, Pete. Well, the point I was trying to make was that um, when we look at when we look at the uh, Mary Rose, not stand again, right? Get me get 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 into the flow. When we look at the Newport ship, we're talking about a transition from creating merchantmen into warships. At the same time, we've got cannons, and we don't know what to do with them, right? Um, and we've got the use of iron on board vessels instead of copper. And then we got the mix between the 14 and the 1500s of gunpowder. So we got a lot of development of these vessels. When we get to the point of the Spanish, when we get to the, um, the Mary Rose uh, in the uh, 1540s, 1546, when, when we then move on a few years into the point of the Spanish and English Armada, we think we have got vessels proper galleons and men of war um, to be at sea. But unfortunately, if there's one thing to have vessels with cannons on, and there's another thing to be able to fire those cannons in tandem um, in a fighting situation. Um, and this is the point that we're actually at in, 60, in the 1620s, where if you're going to have naval superiority, You've got to be a lot better than what the Spanish had been, and you've got to be a lot better than the than Francis Drake's tactics um, against 
um, Spanish vessels coming back from the main um, and uh, the Caribbean, for example. So this is a time when, when the idea of the Navy was for empire building. And this is what the Sp this is what the Swedish wanted to use them for. So the Vasa was built during a time of transition in naval tactics from an era when boarding was still one of the primary ways of fighting enemy ships to an era of strictly organized ship of the line and a focus on victory through su superior gunnery. So in other words, what we wanted was, was a load of little vessels and two or three warships on either side. And th those two chunky vessels, ships of the line, we're going to win the battle. And then if the, if the ships of the line would win the battle, then the other little warships would feed her off and whoever uh, sank the other um, uh, ship, uh, ship of the line was actually the victor. So, so the Vasa was armed with powerful guns. Remember, just, just, a, just a little remembrance, some of those cannons there could be seen to represent uh, the 24 pounders, right? And there were 48 of them. So th these these would dominate, these would dominate the the arrangement of um, cannons on board the vessel. That there was uh, forty eight of them. There were sixty four guns altogether, three pounders, which would probably be on the aft, um, a one pounder, which would probably be um, anti boarding um, cannons, um, and then you've got little howitzers, which would give you a little bit more range against uh, rigging and all the rest of it. <coughs> now getting lost in the in the sort of cannons, we we know this from not only references to do um, with um, the time, but we've also got the archaeology of the vessel as well um, from what's actually um, being discovered. Um, so so one of the things we've, we've what we've got, we've got a ship that's that's ready for firing, but we've also got a ship that's got a load of soldiers on it as well. You know, had 300 soldiers. You don't need 300 soldiers on a vessel like this if you're just going to use the cannons. So in a way, we're not really sure, and they're not really sure what's going on at that time. So, so when when we think when we think about this naval gunnery, um, in other words, in the naval gunnery in the 1400s was obsolete. Naval gunnery in the 1500s was getting there, right? Um, in many ways, when we look at the Spanish and the, the the Spanish and the English Armada, most of the fighting was done on land, right? Um, and in regards to those two armadas, when, when you think about um, the Spanish wanted to um, gather its troops um, from um, the, you know, the, the um, low countries, um, and then we, when we see the um, English following year in 1589 um, is Spain and Portugal. So although these vessels are meant to show um, the 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 this thing about warships is still developing. And Sweden wanted to be one of the first to create this great empire reliant upon the Navy. Uh, the, the, British weren't re the British really didn't have much of a Navy in, in the 1800s. So countries like Sweden, and actually Sweden had access to some of the, some of the better materials for building these vessels. <clears throat> so th they could be at the edge of this sort of um, diversity in moving from trade in regards to these vessels to, to the military sense in regards to the Vasa. Um, so we, we've mentioned um, on board, just, just we, I, I want to, I could go further. Um, I could go further. And one thing I would say is this is going to be quite shocking, right? Um, it was planned. It, it went down. It went down with the with the sixty four guns, right? It was planned. If 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 the um, if the if the um, if 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 things had gone right that day when it when it went on its maiden voyage, right? Uh, they were going to have seventy two guns on board. They were going to have more. Um, so that that would mean that there would there would be more access to um, gun ports, which if the if the um, if if the ship was in heavy water, there'd be more availability of water coming in on board the vessel if the gun ports weren't closed. All those types of things that that say the Mary Rose actually suffered from. <laughs> so um, just just a few just a few other facts. Right, uh, there were stored on board nearly um, 
This doesn't sound a lot, but they're not for later vessels, but they were stored on board nearly 900 kilograms of gunpowder, uh, which is basically close on two tons of gunpowder were stored on board. That doesn't sound a lot, but it's, it's quite a big powder magazine and that's going to be quite lethal if mistakes are made. And there was a uh, there was to be stored a thousand shot of various types for the gun. Now, we've got some evidence of this in the archaeological excavations now um, of the vessel, because obviously um, uh, this this is this is the gun. This is the um, this is the lower deck. Uh, this is the lower deck. So basically what we did see. Uh, we, we've got the upper, uh, the um, sort of the the, the, the middle, uh, the middle deck, which is the lower deck for 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 the uh, artillery. So you've got the upper for cannon. Um, you've got the middle, but that's that classed as the lower deck uh, for, for the guns. And 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 one of the questions that we we mentioned earlier on, and obviously for ballast, uh, you've got um, it, it's got local stone and stuff, and you've got all the barrels and stuff. Um, in the hold there, way below. Um, so this is this is that this is um, you can see how uh, they're working on this uh, in the sense uh, of restoration. So they've got to put um, some uh, props in there, um, and um, I think this is just a show image. Um, this itself is what they believe it looked like. Um, <laughs> when when it was in the day so margaret yeah it, it, it was it was ornamented so this is a one to ten scale model <clears> of the passer uh, with the ship itself seen in the background um oh yeah you can actually see see the ship in the background uh the actual ship itself so you've got a one to ten model uh, and it's believed from the pigments that we know which were ingrained in the wood when it brought up that that's what it looked like that's what it, that's what it looked like now now when you think about it, it it's it's nothing new most vessels at this time would have been like this because and it looks very different from say for example hmx victory it looks very different it, it's you know a lot of money was placed into this and it, and it it was it was meant it was meant for show one of you mentioned earlier on was it just for show and it, it Basically, the, the king wanted this to go, you go, go, go to war, but at the same time, we don't want to scratch on her, right? We 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 actually we we, we want her to go to war, but we we don't want her to go to war. That type of thing. It's a bit of a show ship. I tell you what, if I was an enemy vessel against this, if I if I was the Danish fleet against this, this is this vessel I'd want a pound. I'd want I want I would want everything <laughs> onto this. Um, as was the custom with warships uh, at that time, um, residues of paints have been found on many sculptures, wooden sculptures, um, and the entire ornamentation was once uh, painted in vivid colours. Um, the sides of the uh, beakhead um, and the, the bulwarks and the quarter galleries, the transom, which is there, the, the beautiful transom there, uh, that itself um, were, were all painted red while the sculptures were decorated in, in bright colors. Sculptures, obviously wooden sculptures, yeah, wooden sculptures, a gold leaf in you, right? No money was spared on this vessel. Now, do you know what they always do? They always say, oh, in today's money, this would have cost X amount. Well, I, it's 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 a difficult to call, but I I, I would believe that um, if you're building five of these, and you've got a country that's developing, um, I would say that um, it, your your national purse would be making a massive outlay into this. This this is a lot of investment, a huge amount of investment in this gold leaf, gold leaf. Um, it, it, was, it had been previously uh, believed that the background colour had been blue and that all the sculptures had been gilded. But now, because of new scientific methods, we, we know it looked like this. It was sort of very um, baroque. Um, and they're, they, they're sort of saying with sort of um, last glimpse um, of last, um, a, a last grip 
um, into the old medieval world where, where you've in the old medieval world they put figures on everything right so this is in the new baroque style those old sort of medieval type figures would go but it's still there it's still represented there um so what we've got is we've got pine and oak being used um and linden which is a material i've not really come across before there were 500 sculptures in total um, on board the vessel 500 sculptures um with representations of like of Achilles and Achilles and, and the biblical and national symbols and images. So th this, this was out there, right? And li listen to this as well. They were absolute, they're absolutely, strangely enough, right? This is nuts. This is crazy. We know this in the, we know from what, what's come up. We had depicted Roman, there, there were Roman emperors depicted on board, on board the, the, the transom there. Um, Oh, up to 19 Roman emperors were depicted from Tiberius to Septimus Severus. Septimus Severus. So Septimus Severus died in the year 211. So you've got um, all the way from Tiberius all the way to Septimus Severus. Um, and this, this is itself uh, portraying <laughs> the, the, the embodied embodiment of what the, the king himself of Sweden at that time in, in 1628 he wanted to reach out and say, actually, Sweden is all of this. I am a wise and powerful ruler, and my land is the way to go forward. My, my way is the way to go forward. So the artistic quality of the sculptures varies considerably. Some, some were really of a high level uh, in the sense, and, and you've got, got the uh, royal coat of arms. Some were a bit more vulgar. Some had skill, others didn't. So let, let's sort of move on a little bit more. And... The, these themselves are some of the types of reconstructed figures. Look, at you've got Roman emperors, for God's sake. You've got, you've got figures. Actually, I do believe that figure there uh, is Herman, the, the representation of, of the, the, the German uh, tribes um, that, that, that hit Varus in the woods there, Herman there on the left. That's, that, that's what that looks like to me, alongside Roman emperors there. It's lovely, isn't it? And you, and you got now this itself is very baroque rather than being very uh, and th these masks and these faces are very baroque um uh, and there's no crudeness about any of this this is sort of this is this is erupting so maybe some of the crudeness is is, is like this here uh the one on the left there that's sort of steeping into the medieval world with grapes and vines and that type of thing uh but it's it's, it's sort of getting out there and it's really is is really say and, and you you've got you've got the um uh you've got the wonderful sense of of, of guilt there um and you know you you've got you've got this sort of the way it's looking the very very much the way it's looking Ooh. absolutely fantastic now now here we go this this is this is what they've done uh what they've done they've got a cabinet there and and, and I think this is great uh they they've gone out of their way right they've gone out of their way and they've They've taken samples from the wood and then they've gone out and found, found the colour pigments that were used by the naval shipyard where the ship was built. So, so you know, we, we've got, um, I think we've got a bit of tin oxide there. Uh, we're going to have um, copper oxides. We're going to have um, um, manganese. Uh, we're going to have all those sort of, um, the, the, those sort of oxides and um, all those other pigments. Um and, and this, this is this itself. It, we we know this from from the vessel. We we know what they were using. Um, we 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 know what we, we know what we're seeing. In other words, uh, now now this itself is is um, um, <laughs> this this itself is basically um, they um, th this is the voyage of the Vasa. So um, obviously, um, it's it, it it's gone out to it's gone out to sea uh, between the um, into six, sixteen twenty seven to be fitted um, to be fitted into spring sixteen twenty eight. This is where all the finer stuff goes on, and then it's maiden volet voyage. There, there's basically the maiden volet voyage there from sixteen twenty eight. So we've got we've got a fateful day, sixteen twenty eight. It, it's the it's the tenth of August. It's sixteen twenty eight. 
uh, it's going to be it's going to be very very um, it's going to be very very calm waters. Um, and it was calm waters. It's described. Everything was fine. Everything was chilled. Not a problem. Not a problem. It was leaving the naval station at Al Nabin. Sorry, I can't. I can't stop myself. Al Nabin. Um, and it was the, the the day was calm. Um, it's a light breeze. Fine. A, a southwesterly breeze, which which as me and Pete and Andy would know, it'd be, it's obvious. It's always going to be a southwesterly breeze. Um, and the, the ship was was hauled by anchor along the eastern waterfront of the city to the southern side of the harbour where four sails were set. <clears throat> and the ship made way to the east. Love it. The gun ports were open. Yeah, so were the ones on the Mary Rose. Oh, and the yeah. guns were out to fire a salute as the ship left Stockholm. Yes. I can imagine what happens next. The Vassar passed under the lee of the bluffs to the south. A gust of wind filled her sails and she heeled suddenly to port. The sheets were cast off and the ship slowly righted herself as the gust passed. Nice. At Telgulavikern, uh, where there is a gap in the bluffs, an even stronger gust again forced the ship onto its port side, this time pushing. Here we go. The open lower gun ports under the surface. No. It's a repeat of history. Allowing water to rush in onto the lower gun decks. So it, it, it was that. It was having that additional deck that sank the vessel. That's what did it. The water building up on the deck quickly exceeded the ship's minimal ability to right itself and water continued to pour in until it ran down into the hole. End of the end of the world. The ship, the ship, um, here we go. The, the ship swiftly sank to a depth of 32 meters, um, only 120 meters from shore. So you can imagine, I, it's, it's, it's like, it's like a perfect day for a ship to go down, but people still died. 30 people perished on board the vessel. They, they, most of these individuals couldn't swim. Survivors clung to, clung to debris of the upper mast. And remember, this is, this, is, this, is, this is calm water. So, you know, it's not really breaking up. The vessel didn't really break up. So there's not going to be a lot of stuff floating to the surface. It's in calm water, you know. So um, many, many of the people watching this uh, uh, rushed to their aid. But despite their efforts... 30 people did perish. The Vassar sank in full view of crowd of crowd of hundreds, exactly the same as the Mary Rose, uh, Mary Rose in front of Henry VIII, um, if not thousands of mostly ordinary Stockholmers and, and, and um, so, um, Stockholmers. Um, and, and it was um, Gustav, um, King Gustav's uh, Dolphus um, was shocked, was absolutely shocked. And actually, um, he actually had some ambassadors from countries that he was sort of, you know, going to go to war with and all these other things. And they actually reported back to their countries and basically said, you know, this is, uh, the, the, you know, look, what, what happened to the Swedish Navy? But uh, the Swedish Navy did have their day. They did have their day. They did have their day. Um, there's a lot more I could, I could mention. There was an inquest. Nobody was found guilty. But anyway, um, so the Vassa is a wreck. Less than three days after the disaster, disaster, a contract was signed for the ship to be raised. Naturally, oh, oh yeah, that's what's going to happen. But it was so heavy and so laden that that all attempts were unsuccessful. The earliest attempts were by an English engineer of all people, an Ian Bulmer, um, resulted in writing the ship. So they righted it, uh, but the ship. Um, also got it, it more basically when they righted the ship uh, the ship ship when they righted the ship it got stuck in the mud even deeper in other words the weight it weighted it down in the mud um, so they righted it so um, so all early attempts um, to recover it this is sort of um, an indication of, of an illustration from uh, in 1734 um, this 1734 they, they, there was an attempt made to 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 raise it 
um, and, it, and, it, and it failed again. It must have been in quite a good state in 1734 again. Um, they, lots of attempts were made. In fact, um, um, they, 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 um, in the, in the, in the, towards the late 1600s, they actually used um, a diving bell to raise material from the vessel. Um, interested at weighing the vessel, and, and by 1844, uh, people had people had given up on it. But, but actually, in 1961, people they, they wanted to raise the thing, and that that's basically what happened. Um, it was it was then we found in 1950 in the 1950s. So here we go. Here's two of the night hens. Um, here we go. This is this is how well preserved. That's very well preserved, to be honest with you. Um, very very well. Two other night heads post used to fasten ropes. So we're all part of the rigging. It's quite so you know quite. You wouldn't find this on a on a vessel in, in uh, the navy of the French um, or or Nelson um, at the, at the at Battle of Trafalgar. The details of carved heads have been eroded almost beyond recognition, but there they are. The currents of the Stockholm's um, Strum, but but there it is. It's there. It, it's, it's there for us all to see. So the fats are being, fats are being rediscovered and um, naturally being recovered. And and I've got to got to be very careful of time time now as well. So there it is. Does that does that does that sort of uh, bring memories of the um, uh, remember 1982? Um, there was that um, our Mary Rose on like a a, a yellow cradle. As it as it floated into uh, it's, it's Southampton, isn't it? Um, so base, basically, this is what we've got. We've we've got this 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 is as it sailed in. Great. So this is a recovery. Um, so so they did raise it in 1961, and um, I'll tell you. I'll quickly tell us how they did it now. Uh, the gun ports were closed by means of temporary lids, so they closed the gun ports on board the vessel. Look how well preserved the gun ports are. Amazing. Look at that. Mm. Oh, this has been underwater for nearly 400 years. Um, so initially, before 1961, they had made they had made attempts to um, put cables underneath the vessel and to lift it using pontoons, and uh, they they just couldn't they just couldn't do it. So 1961, they decided to close the gun ports, um, and basically, um, what they needed to do uh, was to try and plug as many holes in the vessel as possible. And the final lift was in 19, uh, on the 8th of April, 1961. And the Vasa was ready to return to the world for the first time in 333 years. Remember, this is 1961, so some time has passed. Um, and it was, and there it is. It's being, it's being floated. There it is. It's great. It, it, well, obviously, um, you know, it, it's, um, th th there's a few supports there to float it in, but it, it's great. It's great. It eventually made it into its own museum. Yeah. Um, in Stockholm um, in 1988. So what I'd like to do now is that I, I, I'm very wary of time, but I, I, I love this artifact. It's, it's, it's a backgammon set found on the Vasa, com complete mm. with Dyson markers. It's great, isn't it? Look at that. Mm. It's complete. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, the Vasa posed an unprecedented challenge for archaeologists. It was unique. Never before had a four-story structure, and that's what it is, uh, with most of its original contents largely undisturbed being available for excavation. So in other words, when they'd raised it, they were able to excavate it in a, in, in a laboratory rather than out at sea. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so as it, as, it, as it was lifted, they closed the gun port, so the contents just didn't come out. It was just like pumped out, which is great. Um, so... The ship had to be kept wet in order that it did not crack out and could be conserved properly. Um, a bit like what happened to the Mary Rose. Digging had to be performed under a constant drizzle of water and in a sludge-covered mud that could be more than one metre deep. So they, they excavate. Amazing. They're not ex excavating underwater, but you've still got all that mud and stuff. Uh, in order to uh, um, establish find locations, the hole was divided into several sections demarcated by many structural beams. The deck, and so in other words, they it was like a land excavation in the mud, um, with sort of water pouring upon them. So it was all simultaneously excavated. So, 
I think I think we've probably answered the causes of sinking. So what I'm going to do finally, I, I, what I want us to do is look at the is is have a quick chat about the fines. I don't call it a night actually because I I think we've really done we've really done a justice on the Vassa tonight. I think we really have. Have done as many um, um, images as we could have, but I, I think we've got a good Im good image of what the Vassa is about. So the Va Vasa had four preserved decks, as we've already mentioned, the upper and lower gun decks, which is key, and the hold and the orlop. Um, so that's basically where all the, um, that, that's going to have the, um, all, all, all the ballast and all, all that type of stuff. <coughs> and uh, and, and uh, obviously that's going to have the bilge. We mentioned the bilge when we looked at uh, Newport ship. Uh, because of the um, constraints of preparing a ship for conservation, the archaeologists just had to work quickly in 13-hour shifts during the first week of excavation. The upper deck was greatly disturbed by the various salvage projects between 1828 and 1961. And it contained not only material that had fallen down from the rigging, we mentioned that earlier on, an upper deck, but also more than three centuries of harbour refuge. The decks below were progressively less disturbed. The gun decks contained not just gun carriages, and three surviving cannons, which is great. We've got three cannons on board, which is brilliant. That identifies it as well. And other objects of a military nature, but were also, uh, were most of the personal possessions of the sailors had been stored at the time of the sink sinking. These included a wide range of loose finds, as well as chests and casks, with spare clothing as shoes, tools, and material for mending. Um, also many, Low denomination copper coins and a sailor's own sort of money there. Privately purchased provisions and all the everyday objects needed for life at sea. Yeah, basically, because diet on board the vessel offered by 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 the Navy of the day was pretty crap. So you would take your own provisions of food on board. Um, if you could get hold of uh, fruit and vitamin C and so on, which were usually not provided until later in lots of navies. Most of the finds of wood testify not only to the simple life on board, but to the general unsophisticated state of Swedish material culture in the 1600s. Pl plain vulgaric stuff, but, but stuff that tells you about Swedish life. And, and, and it does tell you about Swedish life because it, it's the sailors. They're, they're, some of them are the lowest of the low and some of them are quite high up. So it's a good representation, overall representation of society. The lower deck were primary used for storage, and so the hold was filled with barrels of provisions and gunpowder, coils for anchor cable, iron shot for the guns, and the personal possessions of some of the officers, put, which was placed in the hold. On the all up deck, a small compartment contained of the six ships, ten sails, rigging spares, and the working parts of the ship pumps. There you go, that's part of the build. Uh, another compartment contained possessions of the ship carpenters, including a large tool chest. Um, and obviously that that's gonna that's gonna assist with um, um, balancing and, and writing the vessel as well with all that stored um, in the all up as well. And below that you've got directly um, the, the solid ballast. <clears throat> After the ship itself had been salvaged and excavated, the site of the loss was excavated thoroughly during 1963 and 1967. So they went to the site of the vessel after the ship had been lifted. Uh, this produced many items of rigging tackle talked about that earlier on as well as structural timbers that had fallen off particularly from the beakhead and stern castle most of the sculptures that had uh, decorated the exterior of the hull were also found in the mud vis-a-vis -vis had fallen off over the years it's good that it was a, a calm current there as well even though um the the um as currents are uh, in the water it obviously eroded some of the upper uh, architecture as well within the wood. Um, and in the mud as well, outside the vessel, they found the ship's anchor, but also at least the remains of four individuals. So it was good that they went back uh, so we can give them a resting place. The last object to be brought up was nearly um, 12 metre long long boat. There was a long boat, wow, known as an um, esping in Swedish. So we had a long boat. It did have its own survival vessels. Oh, Fact, yeah, it's not not the kind of long boat, Viking long boat. It's just a big rowing boat. Yeah. I, that's what I meant, Andy. You, I didn't expect anyone thought you thought it was a Viking boat, you nana. Did any? Ah. They, no, they nobody thought it was. A, they nobody thought that, did they? Yes, I did actually. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> fair enough. Thank you, Andy. You saved me. 
Um, uh, there, there is actually earlier on in the image, there is actually an image of that. So um, hang on a bit. Let's just. Uh, uh, it it would have it would have been. Um, usually, usually it was hung on the side, wasn't it, Andy? I do. It would. It wouldn't have been launched from. No, um, they they stored them in the middle of the deck normally, um, upside down, out out the way. All right. Thanks for that correction. Um, so this this, however, this was found lying parallel to the ship, right? Um, and is believed to have been towed by the Vassa. So Ooh, interesting. Now hmm. that that, but both both were. It, <laughs> I'm glad we're both wrong on that, Andy. That's rather interesting. What um, that's the type of, you, you're thinking into. Um, the beagle aren't you where they would have towed well uh, it, was cons it was considered very bad form in modern days to, to tow any small craft behind a bigger one so. that was the cause andy of his sinking Many <laughs> objects can can um contaminate in the site were uh, disregarded when the fines were registered but some uh, were the remains of the 1660 salvage efforts and others <coughs> had the story so in other words, they found objects of earlier explorations um and basically this is um this itself is is basically um the pride of 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 the swedish um and how they've how they've gone about the work there absolutely amazing and uh, yeah, this this is basically conservation uh, this is as they're uh, as they're conserving the Vasa during uh, early days of conservation. Um, again, we, we see similar images with the, with the Mary Roads. Um, and just just quickly, um, basically, they um, just, just just sort of just quickly, they, they didn't want it to dry out. Uh, there were 600 cubic meters of oak timber, um, an unprecedented conservation problem, best preserved ship. Well, uh, the same thing, polyethylene glycol. Yeah. So basically, you're um, you're charging it with water, to get salts, and then you need to replace the water itself with polyethylene glycol, um, which is a standard treatment for large waterlogged objects, um, which is what we see with the Mary Rose. But uh, um, obviously, uh, we're learning the the reason the Vasa was well preserved uh, was not just the ship worm that normally devours ships was absent. Within the Stockholm Stream, um, uh, but uh, but um, and, and the shipworm uh, the shipworm was absent because the channel is heavily polluted. So in many ways, um, the the toxic waters of uh, <coughs> that waterway help keep shipworm at bay, help assist in preserving the vessel. So a hostile environment stopped any. Uh, creatures attacking the vessel, which is great, not for the surrounding fish, though. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, we're, we're trying to get rid of the oxides um, out of the wood. We're trying to get um, white and yellow spot residue out of the wood and try to get the sulfates out of the wood so we don't have it deteriorating the wood. Um, and basically, it, it, very interesting, the salts on the surface of the vassar and objects found in and around um, it are not a threat themselves, but they are inside if they're inside the wood. So you've got to sort of try and get rid of all these sulfides so it doesn't destroy the, the ship. This is an ongoing work, uh, an ongoing job to get rid of those um, sulfides, basically um, sulfuric acid. Um, so obviously it's constantly mon monitoring the vessel so it doesn't warp and it's a constant work of, of conservation and working on and making sure... Um, and also one other thing, the, the temperature of uh, the main hall of the Vassar Museum um, is kept at between 18 and 20 degrees C at a humidity, humidity level of 53% to slow the destruction of the acidic compounds. Small objects have been sealed in plastic containers filled uh, with inert um, atmos uh, uh, atmosphere of nitrogen gas, which... Um, which sort of halts any damage caused by these sulfides. So there's a lot of lots of ongoing work, um, and obviously the legacy is that we're talking about it today. And it's 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 a it's it's one of those. Uh, there, there you go, looking down on it there. Um, and obviously, obviously what they've done, you've got the vessel itself, 
uh, and, and you've obviously um, reconstructed the rest of the vessel. And by reconstructing the rest rest of the vessel, you're adding to the ship's um, overall structural integrity um, because everything, the old stuff supports the new stuff and the new stuff supports the old stuff. This, this is the way of doing this. Um, and obviously merchandise and associated with the ship and the, that's uh, reconstruction, which I believe um, that is a um, that is actually being reconstructed by the, a country in the world that's got loads of money to reconstruct these things. The Japanese, so that that's that could sort of, that's based, the transom there, and, and not sort of completely based on on our Vasa, but it gives you a good impression. So what we're going to do, we're going to call out a day now. I, I think we've done a really good uh, overview, of that, right? So uh, let's sort of stop the screen sharing. Are there, are there any questions? No. Where it showed you the two gun decks on that uh, um, uh, profile thing you showed, it showed the larger gun on the upper deck, which I don't think would have been sensible. Say that again? It showed the larger gun on the upper gun deck, as opposed to down on the, uh, the lower gun deck. I would have thought the larger guns would be on the lower gun deck and the smaller guns would have been on the upper gun deck. Yeah. 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 No, that, yeah. I, I can see what you're saying. Obviously, it's still trying to work this out. Yeah. The larger and guns. Of course, are, firing yeah. the guns would have been they made, the, made the ship uh, really unstable. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. It's funny when you're looking at that model, it actually doesn't look that bad a shape. No. No. But then, then again, if you if you look there, if you look there, it's actually quite low in the water with the with the, with the gun port there. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. one you see there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, you're right, they do. They do look the wrong way around, don't they? They do to me. To me yeah. they do, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. But then, then again, you have got what is it? Um, what, what did we say? We had. Uh, um, uh, we we said that we had all together. We had got forty eight of these twenty four pounders. We got three. Yeah. We got three of. We got we we got eight of the three pounders. Yeah. Um, so it's just basically that they're just stuffing the twenty four pounders on on the two deck decks. And then obviously there's no counterbalance, so they're, they're actually the same weights. It must have healed over quite a long way. Well, yeah, you look at the, the you know, the, yeah, the recoil from firing those cannons, yeah. as you say, would have virtually overturned the damn thing. Yeah. If you if you go, that, that's basically the deck. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a gun deck, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's a gun deck, yeah. Oh, any other questions, folks? It's it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because when you look at things like the Victory, I mean, the Victory had three gun decks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, so. But 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 they obviously knew the art of war by by the 1780s, 1790s, you know. Well, I think they'd also worked out to shut the ports when it was tipping up a bit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of basic. But... But, but, but not in regards to the Mary Rose and yeah. the Bass. Didn't happen. Yeah. Mm. That, red, that yeah. red color that they use, they paint all the a lot of houses in Sweden with that red, don't they? Yeah, yeah. they like that red. Bright yeah. colored. Mm. All right. Mm. The thing is, Carl, with the sails, you said the was it the ones they'd use weren't wasn't the best very often best material. What's the best material for a um a sail today? Um well it's it's, it's, not, it's not it's not gonna be silk because it would just tear. Uh, Today uh, it's uh, Egyptian cotton. In those they days. use linen, cotton. yeah, in those yeah. Days from from be, flax, uh, and then oh, and uh, yeah. uh, they've treated it with uh, kind of lead and uh, and oils and stuff yeah. to make it waterproof and heavier. Yeah. But uh, yeah. so that's what the flax cloth yeah. would have been. Would have been the sails. Oh, it was useful, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 And tough enough for a job. What yeah, an yeah. What Extremely. an embarrassing day that would have been. Yes, all the, yeah. all the crowds would they have would they have used a bottle to send it on its way like the Queen does? Yeah, 
<laughs> and they all been there, the and then it just sank in the first gust of wind. Yeah. And everybody, everybody scuttled back home for a cocoa. Yeah. Oops. By the way, when everybody's done with questions, I've just got an urgent announcement to make at the end. Oh. Okay. Oh. So any, any, anyone want, uh, for the people doing the other classes, anyone else want to ask any questions? Margaret? No. Okay. Drina? No, thank you. Who else have we got? Pete, anything else you want to say? No, no, not Roger? nothing else. No, no, that's fine. I'm okay. Andy, and, sure. and we still got Pat there. Have we? No, thank you. Yeah. Yes, no, thanks a lot. Enjoyed it. Uh, okay, then. I've got an announcement to make now. Uh, it, it basically for those who are uh, watching this class on Thursday, um, uh, we've been. We it looks like we've been ordered by the Welsh Assembly that um, uh, Jessica will not be permitted to teach the class live uh, because if she does, if if um, she doesn't do it online, then Archaeology Company will be fun, uh, fined ten grand. Ooh. So uh, all classes have to go online as of now. Oh, God, this is this is quite, this is quite scary stuff. Yeah. Yes, extremely oh. scary. So, uh, it, but uh, I tell you what, um, Andy uh, and Pete, you've got the last questions for today, and we'll call it a night. Go on, anything you want to ask. No, no, that's fine. I guess covered it all. I mean, it's 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 an amazing ship and in such fantastic condition. I'd love to see it. My brother saw it. I think two years ago went to see it. But yeah. oh wow. wow, it's very dark there, and you can hardly see it at all because you know, it's so dark. You know, yeah, yeah. His pictures look like that. Look like it was like kind of black on black almost, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. But of course, the displays all around the outside are good. Yeah. Know. The images are really odd. Those a row of laughing heads. Did you see yeah. them? I know, that's funny. Those were a bit odd. Yeah. They? One of the sketches looked a bit either like a cardinal or a pope or something. It probably wasn't a pope, but had it like a cardinal's tricorn on the top of it. Yeah. It would it Mickey it would, it would, like um, Cardinal Bellamine jars. Yeah. When, yeah. Yeah. What yeah. did this Pro with the? It was just always Mickey taking. Yeah. Yeah. Quite possibly, and also maybe a good look symbol as well, not in wanting to upset anybody. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, yes, I, I I got to build up my en en um, energy now to go up to Brecon. So. Uh, Aye. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Now you behave yourself. Yeah, yeah I, I will behave myself. There's not a lot you could do in, in this cold, is there? <laughs> well, they, do all sorts of, they do all sorts of things with holly. So. Oh, shut up. <laughs> 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 Hang on a minute. What the hell are you on about? What do you mean? It's oh, nothing? yeah, you need to do a bit of research, Carl. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah all right, then we're going to leave that, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd leave it at that, yeah. Hope to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I'm going to say my last class of the year will be tomorrow, Wednesday. Um, the, the we will be. It, the title is uh, everyone's invited to join us. It's six six o'clock. It's it's this link anyway, um, and it's it's uh, we're going to be looking at. Um, we're going to be. Uh, hang on, if I I've, I've got to I've got to just remind myself of the of the precise title. Otherwise, I'll I'll go. Otherwise, I'll get wrong. So if you can bear with me, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, I'll let you know now. Bear with me. We're bearing. Hang on a minute. We, we have posted it online. Oh, if I, hang on. I'm just going to have to remember it myself. Hang on. Um, it, it's bait. Ah, oh, right. Ah, uh, right. Hang on. I'll just type this in. I should get it. I should have written this in my diary myself. I'm preparing it myself. So, like, one sec. One sec, we're nearly there. I don't know where David is tonight. It's a bit disappointing. We would like to have seen David. Okay, right. It's, um, right, yeah, basically, it's an experience of solstice in prehistory. That's what we're doing um, tomorrow at six o'clock for one hour. And it's it's my it's my last Wednesday lecture of the year, uh, but that's what we're doing tomorrow. Um, if anyone else wants to join, then it's fine. Be our guests. 
Um, it's six o'clock. Just sign in. It's for one hour. Anyway, that's it. So uh, if I don't see any, you'll see the other video next week on Tuesday. That will be posted. Um, if there's no other questions from anybody else tonight. No. Yeah. Please. Will we see pictures of you at the solstice tomorrow then? No. Oh. Not oh. in the dark. Shut up. That's very no. definite. Shut up. <laughs> no, no. We don't do okay. that. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, Johnny Nyman might be dressed as a clown, but that's something else. Um, anyway, um, he's a unique guy. Well, right. What was it? What was it going to say? Um, but I'd like to say thanks for your support this year and continued support throughout 2022. And hopefully we'll see lots of Sandra. Um, and to everybody else watching this on Thursday, thanks for your support. Um, everything has to go online for for until when. And um, Look forward to a great new year, and yeah. onwards and upwards. And we're doing prehistory all next year. Well, prehistory hey. about everything. So that's what we're doing. Prehistory this, prehistory that. We will do some continental stuff. What I'm going to do, I'm going to say, Happy Christmas, Happy Yule, and I'm going to say good night to Drina, Margaret, Andy, Peter, Roger, um, Pat, um, and I think that's it. Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Happy Christmas. Bye. See you again Merry soon. Christmas. Bye bye. 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 Bye um and um that's the way things have to go from now on um uh, we we do need everybody's support to keep things going um and uh we'll, we'll go from there thank you very much and well i'll um i'm just going to um try and i'm just going to re read read these chat chat things a minute before i go so I'm just going to put this on the record. Um, um, on, in the chat, we've got largest ever millipede fossil have been found on Northumberland Beach today. Uh, Andy replies, ooh -hoo. Um, Claire says, Merry Christmas, everyone. See you all in the new year. Time to start work. Um, Christmas chaos in retail. Uh, are I going to say this anyway? Uh, this is Anon. I have to chip chip um, to help my mother with something, but I will speak to you on the phone soon. The Welsh um, government has announced fines for not working at home. That's uh, £60 for employees and uh, £10,000 for an employer. So I think it is best to go online next month to cover our bottoms from consequences. It is a shame, but I feel like we must go online as a result. Thank you very, very much for watching this video. All my class members, uh, please keep supporting us. Um, otherwise, we're, <laughs> it's going to be a struggle. Thank you very much um, from Jessica and myself um, and Rona and all at Archaeology Cymru. Good night. Don't forget to like, subscribe and even join the channel. Thank you. Bye.